today on Built to Last. They still build them like they used to. Stairs, as you can imagine, it's, it's like the pinnacle of the carpentry trail. Sure beats cow dung. It'll create these the type of pearls. And how's the view up there? Pick up a hammer. It's time for Built to Last. Built to Last is brought to you by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Labor and Management Committee and Simpson Strong Tie. Welcome to Built to Last. I'm Mark Nilsson. And I'm Monica Peterson. Impressive structures have always been a balance between the artistry of the intricate and the technicality of scale. On today's show, we'll explore the exquisite handwork on display in beautiful mansions and what it takes to erect our towering skyscrapers. So what if I told you that there was a way to clean our drinking water and turn the byproducts into an environmentally friendly fertilizer? Monica, I would tell you that's a million dollar idea. <laughs> well, that's exactly what the folks at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago have in mind. But first, carpenters know they can be the first line of defense in a hospital. So I first met my uh, future daughter-in-law 2013 when my son graduated the police academy. Just looking at them, the family knew that Jen was a keeper. Great girl. Later on that year, she was diagnosed with leukemia. They ended up doing a bone marrow transplant once they found a, a match. Stuck in the hospital, uh, my son visiting every single night, uh, as much as he could between work. March 6, 2016, she acquired a uh, bacterial infection. Being in the hospital, she acquired it. Uh, she's had the chemo. Her immune system's, again, depleted. Um, I got the call from my son on March 8th. And that's what they're trying to minimize. When we come We've been teaching ICRA for almost 10 years now. Infection control risk assessment, a nationally approved uh, set of procedures that brings you to the what you have to do to do construction inside of a hospital. When you go into a healthcare facility, hospital, immediate care, uh, and you have to do rem remodeling or demolition work and change out some ceiling tiles, you have to be able to control the dust. The dust in the rooms when we do construction can uh, affect patients and patient health. It's possible that someone who's immune compromised can get very sick off of the dust that we create. Infections are huge problems in the hospital. There's over two million infections that it can occur in the hospitals. We call them hospital-acquired infections. Um, and about 110,000 can die from those infections. There's materials, um, hazardous materials, there's lead being used, uh, and worse, there's the germs, the uh, bacteria, um, mold. So we teach them, if you're working in a hospital, make sure whatever you're, you're creating, the dust, uh, the debris, you're kicking up any uh, materials, make sure it doesn't get into the rest of the building. All the supervision at Ton & Blank goes through a 24-hour ICRA class. The UBC um, Carpenters ICRA training has been uh, instrumental. Um, a lot of, all of our Ton & Blank field supervision uh, has taken that training. And even the veterans that have uh, been in the construction and hospital construction industry for years can go to that class and take something away. What we're doing here is we're training carpenters in uh, infection control risk assessment. The class covers containment of the work areas. We went into the classroom first and we do a PowerPoint. And then we bring them out here into this area which is set up just for building a soft wall. What can be done in one work shift, we're probably gonna use a soft wall. We're going to tape everything to the floor, to the walls, to seal everything off so that we don't have any air leakage. Classic wall, once we have it up, we're gonna have our zippers ready to go into the soft wall. The vents that we can extend out through the soft wall to monitor the air coming out. Now we're going to put in a uh, air intake, which is a filter into the plastic so we can get some fresh air coming in to replace the air we are taking out. 
So this is the magna helix gauge. We're going to fasten it, we're gonna hang it on this screw up here. And what this gauge does is monitors the air pressure in the room. We need negative air so that when we open our zippers, all the dust in that containment unit comes rushing in to keep the dust inside our unit so that the HEPA filter can take care of it. The HEPA filter system makes sure that uh, we filter out particles down to 0.03 microns, which are smaller than a human hair. Some of those little particles are more dangerous, correct? So that we want to make sure we get those. Any silica dust or uh, fiberglass or drywall dust and such doesn't get out into the rest of the hospital and cause problems. If it's more than one day, we're going to use a hard wall. And it's sealed just like a soft wall is, sealed around all the seams. Anywhere that air can get in, we're going to seal it. We soft wall first, and then construct the hard wall, and the dust we make while we're doing the hard wall, the soft wall is going to contain. It's going to be drywall. We also have manufactured walls that we can put in place with gaskets on them. The hard wall is more permanent. It's something that's going to be there for a long time. First thing that we do is hand hygiene. We do that with our patients, our family members, our staff members, and we actually tell that with our construction wor workers too to wash their hands. Make sure too when the workers come in that they are all up to date on their shots. That way they're not spreading infection also. We use HEPA filters, HEPA vacuums. We also check the temperature and humidity. Uh, we'll do air samples to make sure that the particles are at a safe level. It makes it so that I feel more comfortable being around things like this while a hospital is under construction and expanding. I know that I'm still safe being treated there. Whenever you have um, patient, public, or staff, uh, you want to make sure that the hospital environment stays as if we weren't even here at all. Hopefully all the hospitals get involved with this. It's very important what we do. If you can save one human life, that's enough. Saving lives, that's what it's all about. It makes you feel like a hero, doesn't it? Our members learn how to protect themselves and also how to protect the other people that are in the hospital, whether the patients or the visitors or the ones that work there. You know, when you have someone of your family in the hospital, um, it makes you really understand what, how important that our work is here. It's, it's something that we make our members aware of. You work in a hospital, something can happen. You know, people think that it's a staircase, so you start from the bottom up. You actually don't. You start from the top and work down. At Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions, we take great pride in making a positive difference in the lives of people. With the broadest portfolio in the industry and the technical performance to back it up, you can design and install with confidence. Our ceiling construction expertise, training, and pre-engineered ceiling solutions make it easy for you to seamlessly transition from one end of the building to the other. Improve construction efficiencies and keep every job on time, on budget, and on the mark with Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions. Faster, easier, better. Keeping restaurants and hotels up to date with the latest design trends is a constant challenge. Finding qualified contractors isn't at finishingchicago.com. We work with top designers and general contractors who use the latest painting, drywall finishing, and wall covering techniques in Chicagoland's premier hotels and restaurants. The hospitality industry relies on finishingchicago.com as its free resource to find quality finishing contractors. For a great finish, start with finishingchicago.com. Next, a story of one family's appreciation for fine craftsmanship and another's dedication to preserving his practice. Let's visit a house that marked a change in American architecture. Chicago would be remiss if it didn't acknowledge the significance of the architecture on Prairie Avenue. Um, probably the most significant is the, the Lesner House. At the time they bought the property, Prairie Avenue was the most exclusive residential street in the city. Uh, for six blocks, it was lined with about 90 mansions. The Glesner House was designed by an American architect by the name of Henry Hobson Richardson. It was completed in 1886 and probably considered one of the single most important residential 
designs in the country. It was distinctly different from the other houses being built um, on the street and in the city for that matter. The style was known as Romanesque. It was a heavy, rusticated, rough cut stone, minimal amount of ornamentation. In a rather radical move, rather than facing the main rooms towards the street, uh, he pushed the sides of the house as close as he could towards the street sides and created a large private courtyard in the middle. This resulted in all of the main public rooms facing south into this beautiful sun-filled courtyard that also provided an unusual level of privacy for an urban residence. The neighbors actually did not really appreciate or understand the design of the house. George Pullman, who lived across the street, famously said, I don't know what I ever did in my life to deserve having to look at that every day when I go out my front door. Today it functions as a house museum where people can go and actually experience what it was like when the Glesners lived there. All of their things are there. Their collections are still on the walls. Their art, their architectural fragments are all there. It's amazing. The dining room is the largest room in the house. Uh, the original table would have extended to seat 18 people. The most interesting feature of the room is the 23 karat gold on the ceiling. The idea for this was practical. There's no chandeliers in the house. The Glessners preferred the use of wall sconces, and the idea was that the gold would reflect the light from the sconces and cast a soft light down onto the table. One of the things you'll notice going through the house is the level of craftsmanship. And there's a couple things in particular to notice. One is the types of materials that are used quarter sawn oak. Uh, this is a way of uh, cutting the wood to maximize the beauty of the grain. And what's interesting is you see it not just in the public spaces, you actually see quarter sawn oak in the kitchen and the servants' quarters as well. But you also have to think about the craftsmen that were fashioning the moldings, the bookcases, the built-in furniture. Chicago in particular was, uh, was fortunate because um, it was home to a huge number of European immigrants, German, Eastern European, who brought with them the skills to carve wood. My grandfather, Jens Jensen, immigrated from Denmark, where he studied architecture and actual stair building in Denmark and back in the old country. When he immigrated to Chicago, he worked for most likely the only stair company in the Chicago area at the time. Stairs, as you can imagine, is it was like the pinnacle of the carpentry trade. And it's all based on mathematics and geometry and um, years of experience. I've been carpenter for 37 years. So I've, I've been around the block. The long process is making the stair in the shop. Every stair is different because you've got different dimensions, different heights, different scenarios. We have some craftsmen that have been with us for over 30 years. And they can take a component and manufacture it out of a square block of wood and, and make a nice real fitting of the loot, a crook. Um, you know, there's some old art to it. And you know, I was a part of that when I was growing up too. You know, people think that it's a staircase so you start from the bottom up. You actually don't. You start from the top and work down. It's a wedging system. And once you get the tread in, you wedge. And then you can put the riser in and you wedge it. As you drive that wedge in, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and then the glue sets up and that's all you need. This uh, staircase is unique. There's a tighter radius on top and a tighter radius on the bottom. When I started, you know, everything was hand, all done by hand. I mean, machines, routers, uh, but everything was laid out, calculated by hand. I know how to do it from hand. I can, I can build a custom staircase without a computer. It would be a challenge today. It's been many years since I've done that, but I believe I could still do that. You know, there's always a struggle between, in our world, between union and non-union. And Lakeshore Stair Company has been a union stair company for as long as I can remember. My argument is, is you know, I'll take our experienced carpenters, which the union gives them a strong background in carpentry, whether it's framing, framing roofs, framing, framing walls, trimming, basic stairs, you know, and then we'll take that knowledge and we'll turn them into custom stair builders. I mean, it's, it's a sense of ownership and pride that carpenters, tradesmen walk away with, and myself included. 
look at the final product and we go, wow, that's, we did that. <laughs> Discovery of 7,000-year-old water wells just outside Leipzig, Germany, are believed to be some of the earliest works of skilled carpenters. Since before the turn of the 20th century, carpenters have bravely built higher and higher towards the sky. As construction techniques evolve, skilled labor and contractors have been innovating together to keep tradespeople as safe as possible. I think innovation and construction has to start in the trades. It is a dangerous, dangerous business. You know, we're using our bodies a lot, and uh, there's a lot of uh, on these production jobs when we got to get things done. Things can happen. I think you get a lot of strong, smart people who've been doing it for years. They bring a lot of really good thoughts. A lot of good ideas. Anytime you can get the workers together to come up with an idea that achieves efficiency and safety on the project and send ho workers home safely, it uh, you can't be more happier than that. Our ambition has always driven us towards the sky, but danger is often ambition's dance partner. The invention of the electric elevator freed us to build higher than a handful of stories, and the ceiling of structures became as limitless as our imagination. The evolution of materials and technique allowed us to build higher still, but with every additional floor, the risk increased as well. Our brave workers practiced their trades in the clouds, changed the face of our cities, and grabbed lunch. Steel and masonry evolved into reinforced steel and concrete, and we learned how to pour hundreds of feet in the air. Hundreds turned to over a thousand. The level of danger rose as well, demanding more innovation and safety. From my point of view, the transfer from individuals from one elevation to a higher elevation is a risky business in itself. Adjustable Forms is a very progressive-minded company. You know, although we're very old and established, um, we try to really be innovative in what we do. The nature of our project is primarily high-rise uh, construction. We typically do vertical construction, uh, commercial buildings in particular. Well, certainly the success of the job is driven by production. You know, we need to maintain our schedule, and to do so, we need efficient use of both our manpower and materials. We're on three-day pour cycles with these high-rises. We pour concrete, we set shoring on top of that concrete, we build the next deck. So everybody just wants their decks in first, and it was just easy enough to step, to just slap a ladder in place and have guys do that. So the CRCC has been a really great resource for us in terms of bringing good young talent into adjustable forms. I had had a little bit of stairs experience working for another co concrete company. And uh, so they, they gave me the opportunity to work with an, an older guy named Scotty in the stairs, right? He was an expert. It's very critical to our success to have new blood in the trades. You know, as, as some of the older generation retires, you know, it's very important that we have young guys stepping in and filling those roles. And a lot of those roles become leadership roles. We were so fast that we started framing the stairs before there was a deck to frame up to. Uh, I remember him mentioning all the time, we should just pour it like that. Next job, they thought I showed enough to where I could be in charge of the stairs for that next building. So for that, from the ground up from that building, I would frame the stairs before there was a deck to frame them to. The idea is that it's safer because we're not using ladders to climb from floor to floor now. My safety director, Jeff Phillips, he was uh, definitely somebody who, uh, who kind of worked with me to make sure we were doing it safe, and then they saw the value in how safe it was. It was a collaboration between field and office and finding a better way to do something. Adjustable Forms embraced it and incorporated it into their three-day pour cycle. First, we, we take the uh, 3D CAD drawing and the building information model, the BIM model. Uh, we get measurements based off of that BIM model and we send it to the carpenters in the field. The survey technicians plot those lines for our carpenters to get their measurements of the landings and the risers ahead of the deck for the floating stairs. From then we start to build the, the base of the forms. The forms continue to, to grow and we add the safety rails on those. The rebar is then installed. The risers are installed shortly after that and shortly after that we're pouring and finishing the concrete. 
all within a three-day process. One of the, the main benefits of taking the stairs up ahead of the working deck is that you're taking a system in place that's already part of the structure at no additional cost, and you're just finding a better way to build it. If we weren't using the floating stairs, we would have ladders or stair towers in place. Ladders we have to purchase, stair towers we have to build. Since we're using the floating stair method, we're already building a finished product into the project. So you're taking something where you don't have to drive costs upward to the owner, to the general contractor, you just work in a more efficient, better way. I don't know how many times people came up to me when I was framing those stairs and these were guys who were in concrete for, for years and they'd be like, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years, I've never seen anything like that. We're only as good as the people that we employ and Frank has been instrumental in a lot of ways in helping us progress. If it wasn't for the classes I was taking, um, I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of what I did in the field. It's very important to see how organized labor has responded to what the market demands. You know, I think, I think the emphasis of safety in the last, I'd say five to 10 years in particular from the general contracting community has been very profound. Uh, many of our jobs now, the requirements on the project specifically, meet and exceed OSHA, you know, many times over. The more we listen and the more we utilize skilled tradesmen, the more ideas that are gonna come out of it. The more we listen, the more, uh, the more we learn from them. Once we're up into full production at that eight to 10,000 tons, we'll have enough product to be able to grow one billion pounds of potatoes. Stabilo for over 125 years has led the industry in measuring and leveling. Still manufactured in Germany since 1865, tradesmen rely on Stabilo every day for its precision and durability. We continue to revolutionize the way we build with our lasers, levels, and laser distance measuring tools on commercial and residential job sites around the world. Stabila, how true pros measure. Meet the new family of Blaze Laser Measures from Bosch. Go ahead, turn it on and start measuring. It's that simple. The Blaze family offers a wide range of functions to tackle any measuring job. Extend your reach with accuracy up to a 16th of an inch with Bluetooth enabled devices Easily transfer measurements to your smartphone or tablet with free Bosch apps. Reach farther, work faster, and stay accurate with the Bosch Blaze family of laser measures. Measure on. Raw sewage might not be a topic for polite dinner conversation. Well, at least that's what my grandma says. But at the Stickney Water Treatment Plant, there is nothing more exciting. I'm a real big steelhead fisherman. I love fly fishing. I love big fish. Going fishing is a rich thread in our nation's tapestry. And generation after generation of Americans have enjoyed casting a line. But nothing brings a fishing trip to a halt like algae blooms. Fish are harmed by algae blooms because it's toxic and it also kills their, their food source. So the fish start dying off and you get big fish kills. Algae blooms are caused by phosphorus, a unique mineral that gets into the water via agricultural runoff. If you have large amounts of phosphorus um, and nitrogen in a water stream, it depletes the oxygen from that water stream. That affects uh, fish, plant life, aquatic life. But as dangerous as phosphorus can be for fishing, it is equally essential for another pillar of American life, agriculture. Phosphorus is an integral part of the fertilizer that helps plants grow. A lot of times it's mined either in Florida or uh, there are some deposits in Morocco, uh, but some forecasts show that they'll be depleted within about 100 years. At the Stickney Water Reclamation Plant in Illinois, scientists, engineers, and city officials are tackling these problems by working on an environmentally friendly way to remove phosphorus from the water and then to repurpose it as a groundbreaking new fertilizer. The Water Reclamation District is dedicated to becoming the utility of the future. Ostara's technology is a solution to managing the overabundance of phosphorus while creating a revenue stream through the sale of the fertilizer. This is a win for the environment as well as Cook County taxpayers. An endeavor of this magnitude and a facility this complex needs highly trained and specialized workers. From the Carpenters Union and Millwright standpoint, we are very proud 
to be part of this type of building project that is going to make our complete Chica greater Chicagoland area safer, cleaner, more productive. Not only did carpenters and millwrights play an essential role in building the facility, but millwrights are also responsible for the mechanical and industrial parts of the plant. They precision set the equipment, align pumps and motors, they install conveyors. In short, millwrights are ensuring that the facility and its reactor system function properly. So how does it all work? Right now you're standing in our phosphorus recovery facility. Through our wastewater process, uh, we have solids and liquids. We take the solids, uh, we treat them, uh, we then run them through a centrifuge and that extracts the liquid from it. And we're going to take that liquid and we're going to add sodium hydroxide and magnesium. And from there then the flow will move over to the three reactors. Actually, that's where the magic happens. At the bottom of the reactor itself, at the cone, we add the extra chemicals we need to form the phosphorus product as well as adjust the pH so that we can make the reaction happen. And then part of that flow just comes back down this recycle pump and just keeps recycling through the reactor. You're just creating a crystal that slowly grows. You're creating somewhat of a, of a pearl looking or a pellet type of product. Everything that we showed before and did produces this product of phosphorus. And that's called struvite and that will be used as a fertilizer. Over the years, you've heard people concerned about runoff water from anywhere that uses fertilizer. And that's what we're making here. But what we're able to make from a wastewater treatment facility is a very environmentally and agriculturally friendly type of fertilizer. Normally, you'd put phosphorus on agriculture, if there's a heavy rainstorm, it'll be washed away. This will not be washed away. It'll be used when the plant is ready to use it. That works well in terms of stormwater runoff. Um, it works well in terms of conserving phosphorus as a mineral. Along with achieving its primary goal of benefits for agriculture and the environment through conservation and sustainability, this project brings even more positives for the community. This facility could also help the taxpayers of Cook County greatly in that now the MWRD becomes a supplier and can sell. And how much can they produce at the facility? We're going to produce probably approximately 2,500 to 3,500 tons of product per year. That equals about a billion uh, potatoes uh, that can be produced and some could say more importantly, 250 million bags of potato chips. That's all for this episode of Built to Last. Monica, I got one for you. I once told a carpenter I wanted no carpet on my steps. You heard this one, a blank stare. She's getting good at this. We'll see you next You're time. Out of my window.